Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us at the Broomfield Veterans Museum for our 199th Coffee and Conversation. So our next one, we'll have to have a little special celebration as we hit the 200-year number mark. Uh, again, as you noticed coming into the museum today, uh, we're kind of having a special event, both in terms of uh, the starting of a new exhibit we have upstairs in our main room, which we hope you'll stop by and see. Uh, it's a story about a young Civil War soldier of the 11th Michigan uh, during a Civil War, and in particular focused on a Sharps rifle, or actually a carbine, which this uh, young soldier used and has been passed down the generations for 150 years to Tracy Perry, who also has been one of our Coffee and Conversation speakers several times. Uh, and actually, we have a short little video there by Tracy talking about his great-grandfather. Uh, so please, and of course, outside, uh, you see a marvelous setup of Civil War reenactors uh, of all sorts. And I think we even have a horse uh, up there somewhere. Uh, so please visit with them as well, and if you haven't spent time in the museum recently, uh, uh, please uh, stick around. We have lots of refreshments, and we're hoping everyone will help us uh, kind of uh, uh, take care of that. I would like to highlight, before we get going, uh, our two upcoming talks that will be in April. Uh, our speaker on the 10th of April is Donna Miller, and she's going to talk about the history of the WASPs, the Women's Air Force Auxiliary Group, which did such a tremendous job of ferrying uh, fighters and bombers uh, from the manufacturing plants to where they were going to be needed. Uh, and Donna has a, a kind of a marvelous uh, career as well. She's currently a first officer for American Airlines flying the Boeing 787 internationally. So we had to kind of fit her availability into her current flight schedule. Uh, but really a tremendous, fabulous person, and we'll give a great talk with that. Then we shift uh, on the 24th of April, Jim Whitlar is going to join us. And instead of talking about uh, airplanes and the normal stuff we do, uh, Jim was an Atlas missile mechanic in one of the various m missile silos that were scattered all across Montana, Wyoming, and even the north part of Colorado. Uh, so we'll get a, an interesting look in terms of what it was like to babysit these thermonuclear missiles that you know, have been just kind of sitting around and we don't really give it much thought. Uh, but they certainly are, are still there with us. So without further ado, I would like to pass this over to uh, the commander of American Legion Post 58 yep. here and to talk about his rebel great uncle. That's great. right. Thank you. I'm, I'm good here on this yep. one. Okay. Uh, Perfect. Don't forget your phone. Also, I have copies of our schedule that I'll leave on the table back here if you need them. Don't forget your phone. Yes, thank you. Uh, phones, if you've got some uh, good time to turn, on, turn them off, or put them on silent. Thank you, Mike. So thank you for uh, having me. I'm also a director here of the, at the museum, so uh, I'm very proud uh, to, to be a director. And I'm proud to have uh, an ancestor who was involved in the Civil War, Alfred B. Petacolis, Alfred Brown Petacolis. Uh, on your handouts, you'll see it's, I think they put down uh, Albert. It's actually Alfred Brown Petacolis. So uh, A.B., and I'll be referring to him as A.B. or, or Petacolis as I, as I talk about him. So uh, before I go any further, though, we're going to be talking about the uh, Confederates. We're talking about rebels and the division of the United States. Uh, we're going to talk about the Battle of Glorietta 159 years ago and the start of the Civil War 160 years ago. So I'd like to have everybody stand up, please, and after me recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Our flag is in place in the corner. 
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I appreciate that. OK, so um, first of all, a little bit about me. Um, I was, uh, I'm a retired commander of the United States Navy, United States Naval Reserve. Uh, I went to the University of Toledo. Uh, I had a, flew a lot of different airplanes. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But what I do want to point out is in 1984, I was a flight instructor at Naval Air Station Beeville, Texas, uh, doing care qualifications. And during that time that I was uh, in Texas in 1984, I was in church one day and a little lady uh, came up to me and she had a newspaper clipping and she said, are you related to this A.B. Petacolis that just, they just published his journal at the University of New Mexico Press? And I said, I don't know, but I bet I am because there's not that many Petacolises in the United States. And so I never thought very much about it except I did order the uh, Rebel on the Rio Grande which uh, is the book that uh, was the journal, that based on the journal of A.B. Petacolis. And so I went ahead and, and ordered that. Now recently, I've kind of looked back on our uh, connection, if you will. And uh, this, is, uh, this is me, obviously, here. My father, Richard Philip Petacolis, Philip A. Petacolis, his father, Arthur L. Petacolis, that was for Lewis, I believe. Philip A, another Philip. You notice there's a lot of Philips <laughs> through there. And Philip A. Petacolis was the brother of Alfred B. Petacolis, whose father was Julius A. Petacolis. And so that's, that is my connection. Um, it's interesting that the Peta I, one thing about A.B. Petacolis, he was a, he was a writer. Uh, he wrote a journal his entire life. He was a sketch artist, and he came out by that pretty honestly, because Julius Petacolis and Philip A. Petacolis were great artists, apparently. And uh, the whole family, as a matter of fact, Philip A. Petacolis, uh, his sons were all artists, and Philip A. Petacolis was a miniature portraitist. Philip A. Petacolis came over from France to Haiti got caught up in the French uh, slave rebellion, actually the slave rebellion in Haiti during the early 1790s. And uh, so the, the oral history of the family is that he stowed away with his wife and child on an, on an American vessel to the United States sometime in the early 1790s. That was to get away from being uh, inducted into the armed services put, put down the fl slave rebellion. So that's, uh, that's the connection. So Philip A. Petacolis uh, came to Philadelphia. He, was, he hung out his shingles as a miniature portraitist. His uh, claim to fame was that he did a miniature portrait of George Washington. And that uh, miniature portrait is in the Fogg Museum in Boston to this day. And uh, he was uh, an artist, uh, trained in, in Paris. He also served in the army in, in France, or I guess it was the Bavarian army. And uh, so his sons, uh, Julius, of Julius A. Petacolos was one. There was three other sons. They were all artists. They were, that was, that was what, what they did. So bottom line is, uh, Alfred came by pretty uh, honestly. So unfortunately, Philip A. Petacolis uh, missed out on all that, and I don't think we have any, except for maybe my daughter, I don't think we have any <laughs> artists in the family on that side. Uh, anyway, so uh, that's a little history of that. So A. B. Petacolis, Alfred B. Petacolis. This is a photo of him as a young man. And uh, he, uh, like I said, he, he came by his uh, talent uh, probably pretty honestly. So. As a young man, his father, Julius, uh, died when uh, Alfred was just a young boy. And he was actually raised by his uh, uncle, Robert Brown. Robert Brown was a lawyer. And uh, so A.B. Petacolis decided to go into the law. Uh, and as a young man, he, uh, in 1859, in between 56 and 59, he read for the law 
in, in and around Richmond and Amherst County, uh, Virginia. And he did that with his, uh, bro with his uh, uncle, Robert uh, Brown. And of course, you notice Brown is his middle name because on that side of the family, he was named uh, Brown uh, for his uh, mother's father. So as a young man, uh, he uh, was a sketch artist. And uh, he made all kinds of sketches of the local Virginia area. Um, he lived in Amherst County. Uh, he ran a, a private school. In order to pay for his uh, law studies, he ran a private school and uh, uh, you know, read for the law under uh, Robert Brown. And uh, he pursued art and sketching as a hobby. And he showed a talent like his father and his uh, grandfather before him. He enjoyed sketching the uh, countryside. These are actually uh, scenes that he sketched. And are, they are in uh, museums back east uh, in, Richmond, in and around Richmond, uh, Virginia. So scenes of Amherst County, Virginia, where, where he uh, basically uh, where he uh, had his little school. In 1859, he finally um, uh, was admitted to the bar in Virginia. And uh, he decided to migrate to Victoria, Texas. Um, <clears throat> so in Victoria, Texas, in 59, 1859, he uh, went ahead and, and he uh, opened up a law practice with uh, Samuel White. Uh, he, like I said, he always kept a journal. And he was always uh, sketching his scenery and uh, making local uh, sketches of the, of the surrounding area. Um, the, uh, this particular scene here is from the uh, Victoria Courthouse cupola. Uh, and this is of, of the Main Street. Now, I want you to keep this in mind, because later on, at the end of the presentation, he did another sketch about five years later. So we'll, uh, we'll get to that uh, in a minute. So 1859 to 1861, he was a lawyer in Texas. And the Civil War came about. And he was kind of apolitical. He didn't really uh, have any strong leanings whatsoever. However, he was raised in Virginia, and he was a Texan. And uh, if uh, you do any kind of research, you'll find that uh, most people who were raised in the states that seceded became rebels or Confederates. And those that were in the North were uh, North. But he was very kind of apolitical. But uh, he joined the, um, uh, after, well, after the uh, uh, Texas seceded from the Union, he joined uh, a conf Confederate army in May. It was a little volunteer unit in Victoria, the Victoria Blues. And they later uh, became the Victoria Invincibles. I think the reason, I don't know this for a fact, but I think the reason is Victoria Blues, Blues, Union, the Blues and the Grays. So I think they didn't like that. So they changed it to Victoria Invincibles. Uh, later, uh, when uh, Sibley formed his regiment to invade New Mexico territory, he traveled to San Antonio, his unit did, and he became a part of the New Mexico uh, invasion, of, I'm sorry, the uh, Sibley's Brigade and uh, Company C, 4th Regiment of the Texas uh, Mounted Volunteers. Uh, General, General Sibley, uh, Henry Sibley, um, he, he, after, he, he had been actually an um, officer in the Union Army at Fort Craig, I believe, in the New Mexico Territory. After uh, the Civil War started, or after the secession of the uh, Texas especially, he traveled back to uh, Richmond, met with uh, Jefferson Davis, and concocted the invasion of New Mexico uh, scheme. And uh, Davis uh, gave his uh, OK for it, figuring probably it's uh, pretty inexpensive and it might pay off big time. So uh, they made him a general. And he came back to San Antonio and started recruiting. And that's when A.B. Petacolis went up and, and, uh, with his unit and, and enlisted in the uh, Sibley Brigade. When he was in San Antonio, and I don't know the exact date. This is a sketch by A.B. Petacolis of the Alamo. 
Uh, I had uh, talking to Mike Fellows here the other day, and he looked and he says, well, he says 18, 1859, 1860, there's a roof on that. And in fact, uh, the Alamo, they put a roof on the Alamo sometime before the Civil War and made it a storehouse. So the Alamo was actually a, a, a warehouse of, of some kind. Anyway, uh, A.B. Petticolis made this uh, sketch either before or after the uh, invasion of, of uh, New Mexico. So let's see, where am I? So when uh, Sibley organized his brigade, he started from San Antonio. And the way, they, uh, the way they went was from San Antonio was they followed an old stage line. And this old stage line was going to Franklin, Texas. Franklin was the name of El Paso. El Paso uh, didn't become El Paso until I believe in the 1870s. Uh, they've changed the name. Actually, El Paso was El Paso del Norte was the Mexican city on the south side of the Rio Grande. Uh, as you can see right here. But uh, Franklin was the name of the ticks. Uh, Fort Bliss was there. Uh, Fort Fillmore was in New Mexico territory. But there were various forts. So at the start of the Civil War, the Union vacated that area of uh, West Texas. Well, they vacated all of the Union forts in, in Texas. But they vacated the, uh, the forts in especially West Texas. Um, there was a, a colonel by the name of Baylor who took Confederate uh, troops from Texas, actually they were Texans, uh, to West Texas to occupy those uh, vacated uh, forts. And uh, they uh, actually uh, took over a lot of uh, supplies, military supplies, uh, and that becomes uh, evident here later on when uh, Sibley's campaign came through. But Baylor also uh, captured Fort Fillmore from the Union troops probably because the Union commander was not very uh, good. And uh, Fort Fillmore fell to the, uh, uh, to the Confederates. Uh, the Union so, uh, forces then uh, went up to Fort Craig. And Fort Craig is, is northern part of the territory. And uh, so it's interesting that, that they did uh, vacate those forts and, and military supplies. Also. Uh, interesting is that when the Texas Brigade went to uh, Franklin, they really, uh, they fought under the Texas flag. If you look at all the pictures and all the paintings of the, uh, including uh, A.B. Petticolis' sketches, the battle flag is uh, the Texas flag, not the stars and bars. I find that interesting. Uh, and uh, because this is 1862, so the Civil War has been going on for uh, at least uh, six months to a year. So after they got to um, uh, Fort Bliss, I'm sorry, to uh, you know, Fort Bliss area and Franklin, which is down here, this is Fort Craig up here. And uh, they uh, utilized a lot of the Union supplies that, they, that had been captured. And so many of the soldiers would, who didn't have necessarily Confederate uniforms, they actually were wearing uh, overcoats, for instance, that were Union uh, overcoats. And that comes into play later on at the uh, Battle of Glorieta Pass. Uh, anyway, so they moved on up. Unfortunately, so A.B. Petticolis uh, had several volumes of his journal during this time. The first volume covered his time in uh, Victoria, Texas, San Antonio, when he, when he uh, enlisted. Uh, the travel to uh, uh, Franklin, and then all the way, going all the way up to uh, Fort Craig and the Battle of Alverde, he had a volume one. Unfortunately, that was destroyed later on at the Battle of Glorieta Pass when the Union troops uh, destroyed all the wagons that the Confederate supplies were in. That was where his volume one was. His volume two picks up just before the Battle of Valverde. Fortunately for us, because of course that's what the, his journal uh, in this book is, is based on. And um, his writing is very readable. Um, he was a very good writer and a sketch artist. Um, I noticed that throughout uh, his book, if you look at the sketches, some of them are kind of incomplete, not, not, almost not really amateurish, but kind of not incomplete. And then some are very, very complete, very good. And I think that's a matter of time, what he had time to sketch or go back and, uh, and redo. 
So the Battle of Alberti, as the uh, Confederates, uh, Texans, I should say, uh, moved up, uh, oh, sorry, uh, moved up toward Fort Cragg, uh, Fort Cragg was being occupied by uh, Colonel Canby, uh, the Union forces. And uh, if you notice, there's a little dotted line here. What, what the Confederates tried to do is, first of all, Fort, Canby wouldn't come out of the fort <laughs> so when they got there initially. So Sibley wanted to draw Canby out. So actually, when it started going around Fort Cragg on the uh, east side of the, of the uh, uh, Rio Grande, and Fort Cragg is on the west side, and they were hoping to draw them out, and they did. They drew them out. Uh, the, the Union forces uh, came out across the river and to confront the uh, Texans. Also, before I go a little further, I also note when Baylor uh, captured uh, Fort Fillmore, uh, he actually established what he called the uh, Confederate uh, Arizona. You see that, this line right here? So the southern part of that, New Mexico territory, which was Union, prop, uh, Union territory, uh, the Confederates then claimed southern New Mexico, and they called it uh, Confederate Arizona. Anything above uh, Fort Craig and, and that line was New Mexico territory belonging to the Union. That's where Fort Union was. Uh, that's where Glorieta uh, Pass is. And so that's why we call it the invasion of New Mexico. So they drew the, they, they drew the uh, Unions out to, uh, to a battle. And that was the Battle of Valverde. And the Battle of Valverde, um, the uh, Texas, Texans eventually claimed victory because they basically forced the Union soldiers to leave the field and return to Fort Craig. Um, they did not capture Fort Craig, and that's very important. This is a sketch of, of the Battle of Valverde from A.B. Petacolis's journal. And if you look, he's got the, Tex the mounted Texas infantry here. He's got, this is the Union forces here. Uh, which were regular Union soldiers, and then this was the New Mexico volunteers in back. If you look, you can see this is the Rio Grande the River, Fort Craig is someplace over here, and these are artillery pieces. The balance of this sketch is missing. Apparently was destroyed somehow. So the left half of, of his sketch is the only thing that, that survives. Uh, but it's very interesting uh, how he arranged uh, the, at least the opening of the battle. So after the battle, uh, Sibley is, is stuck. He's either, he basically has three options. He asked for the surrender of Canby, and Canby refused to surrender. So now Sibley's got to do two, one, of, one of three things. He's either got to return to Franklin, he's got to go on to Santa Fe, or lay siege to Fort Craig. It's kind of, you know, you don't really want to leave uh, an, an enemy force in your rear, but that's exactly what he did. But, and mainly because he was show, getting low on, on food. So uh, he was uh, low on rations. Um, during the battle, they lost a lot of uh, amounts, uh, mules and, and horses. And so what they ended up having to do was... Um, the, they, they didn't have enough to pull their wagons and mount their infantry, so uh, they had the infantry turn in their mounts to the, to the government. Oh, here's a, another th interesting thing is um, the, uh, all through his journal, he refers to the Union troops. Not, he, does, he, he does refer to them Yankees occasionally, but usually it's abs. He talked about the abs did this and the abs did that. And I couldn't understand what the abs were until I looked at a little footnote there in the, in the book. Abs were for abolitionists. So he, and this, they, think, they think this was probably a Texas term that they used uh, for uh, Yankee soldiers or Union soldiers. So uh, due to the lack of, from Valverde on to Santa Fe, they decided to go to Santa Fe, Santa Fe move on. But due to the lack of supplies, uh, as I mentioned, and lack of horses and stuff, um, they, uh, they decided to go on to Albuquerque and Santa Fe to capture those military supplies. Um, during the Battle of Valverde, after the Battle of Valverde, they actually picked up a lot of uh, weapons, 
Um, and uh, they actually uh, had captured some artillery. And that artillery actually, uh, AB Pedagogues was involved in the capture of uh, some of those artillery pieces. And you can see, I didn't, I failed to show you that, but if you look right here, those are, the, those are a couple of the artillery pieces that were captured by A.B. Petacolis and his unit when they charged. And they overcame the artillery, and uh, it's an interesting story. So, um, so they took the captured artillery. Uh, they were short on rations. They moved on north. And um, uh, they were judge, and though they continued on to Judge Baird's residence. Judge Baird's residence or ranch was actually in the South Valley of Albuquerque, a few miles from Albuquerque, and uh, uh, that's where they were heading. Unfortunately, um, Canby, and Tis when the Confederates started uh, moving north, Texans started moving north, uh, Canby uh, sent uh, dispatches up to Albuquerque and Santa Fe and had them evacuate Santa Fe and Albuquerque and destroy all military supplies. And because uh, the uh, rebels were a little bit slow, uh, that impacted them. But uh, at Judge, this is a, a little drawing of Judge Baird's residence that's uh, it's, it's sketched in his sketchbook. I believe it's still in existence. Uh, much modified, but there, I think some of the structures are still uh, present to this day. Um, they, uh, so they traveled to Albuquerque on foot. They had turned in their, uh, their mounts. Uh, Petacolis was uh, given a script or an or a IOU, if you will, from the Confederate government for $110, which was the value of his uh, horse. He never, he never saw that money again. <laughs> And they camped about a quarter mile from Judge uh, Baird's residence. They were there for a little while. That's how he was able to do this uh, little sketch. Uh, Judge Baird was a uh, Southern sympathizer. And when uh, prior to the Compromise of 1850, which was actually a set of five compromises, but uh, Compromise 1850, after the, the Span or after the Mexican War, Texas claimed uh, the New Mexico Territory, and so. Santa Fe County, Texas, was considered part of Texas territory. And so uh, the Texas government had sent Judge Baird to Santa Fe to, to be a judge. He was, he was going to be a judge of the local area. After the Compromise 1850, Texas relinquished their claim on that portion of the uh, New Mexico territory. And uh, so, but Judge Baird stayed. But he was from Texas. He was a Southern sympathizer. And uh, he provide help. He provide some uh, rations, wood, and supplies to a lot of the soldiers that were moving on up. So, uh, lured by Colonel Camby, as I mentioned, Santa Fe and Albuquerque are destroyed. Uh, military supplies. Uh, the uh, Texans uh, sent advance uh, uh, parties up to Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and they did uh, occupy those uh, two cities. And uh, they were able to obtain enough supplies and ration, rations for, uh, from the local population to last them about a month, uh, give or take. And um, meanwhile, Canby had also alerted Fort Union. And the uh, Union, uh, the Colorado Volunteers, Pikes Peakers, as the Texans count, called them, and, and the uh, first Texas Volunteers started moving south toward uh, Fort Union and eventually uh, Glorieta Pass. So this was the, uh, this is kind of a battle map of uh, the Battle of Glorieta Pass. Um, after uh, Judge Baird's, uh, Petacolis' unit slowly moved uh, north towards uh, Santa Fe, they did not go to the city of, of Albuquerque and the city of Santa Fe per se. They were uh, moving uh, off in the mountains and uh, away from those uh, the cities. And they moved kind of slowly for a couple weeks. Um, as I mentioned, the, the uh, Union troops were coming out of Fort Union and uh, moving on down. They opposed each other along the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, this is the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, Pigeons Ranch is in the, kind of the middle of Santa Fe Pass. Uh, you don't see it off here is uh, Johnson's uh, Ranch. And then you don't see it off here is uh, Kowlowski's uh, ranch. And the pass, uh, 
stretches uh, in between. This battle map is, uh, a, is basically a uh, depiction of the entire fighting for that day, starting at 11 a.m., ending at about 4.30 or 5, so about six hours. This was the first part of it. So Union troops uh, were arrayed here. The, uh, the rebels, uh, Texans, were arrayed here with their artillery. And uh, then at uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, after they were flanked by the Confederates, they moved down the valley to Pigeon's Ranch. This is the Union Army. They set up a defensive line here. And the, meanwhile, the Confederates are moving uh, across, down the valley and moving the Union troops out. By, by 4.35 o'clock, they've actually moved the Union troops back here, uh, where they've set up their artillery. Uh, this is the Confederates. And uh, this was Petacolis's route throughout in, in his, uh, his company. He was on the south side of the, uh, of the battle. Um, because they captured uh, a lot of the supplies that, uh, military supplies that the Union had in the forts to the south, there were the, a, lot of the rebel, a lot of the rebel Texans were wearing uh, overcoats and military accoutrements from the Union Army, and especially the overcoats, because it was cold. There was snow on the ground. Uh, it was cold in the morning, and though they had these overcoats, and the overcoats were, were Union, uh, Union overcoats. Many of them wore that. Uh, that comes in uh, pretty interestingly here, because uh, as Petacolis' unit uh, moved throughout the day, toward the end of the day, uh, he actually got intermingled with some of the uh, Union troops. And so what I'd, I'd like to read a little, uh, a little excerpt from uh, his journal. And he talks about how he uh, intermingled with the, uh, with the Union line. So he says, I was thus slowly advancing. And after having fired a half dozen shots thus, was loading my gun when turning half around and to my astonishment, saw I was in two feet of a line of 100 men, all strangers to me. Another glance as I returned ramming convinced me that they were Pike's Peakers and in a moment I thought, well, I'm a prisoner after all. Here are the enemy. Before I could act upon this conviction, in fact, before I had decided what to do with 50 men looking at me, and, pro and processing the power to riddle me with a pistol, with pistol balls or mini balls, or plunge a bayonet into me, the major of the enemy nearest me, a man with a red band cap, dark eyes, whiskers, and a rather handsome face, about five foot ten inches, said, looking straight into my face, "You had better look out, Captain, or those fellows are going to shoot you." Now, though I knew that he referred to our men and mistook me for some of his own side, I felt puzzled to say anything save to look inquiringly at him and ask, who will? My voice did not betray that 50 men were looking at me, and none of them, by word or sign, showed that he knew me in my true character. He answered, why, those fellows over yonder, pointing in the direction of our boys. There are two or three of them over there shooting at us. Is there, I said. Then I'll go over that way and take a shot at them. Oh, now I lost my place here, sorry. I'll go over there and take a shot at them. I started off with my gun at charged bayonets, walking cautiously, take advantage, taking advantage of the trees as if advancing on a real foe. And as I thus walked off, I looked anew over my shoulder at the man who had been talking to me. He was watching me very closely. And I felt some uneasiness, lest he should shoot me in the back as I went off. But his honest eyes looked like there was no suspicion. And in a dozen steps or further, I was out of sight and over our, into our own lines once more. So rather interesting. So during the main battle, while all this was going on, the six-hour battle, Major Shevington of the Union Cavalry had been moving south around the battlefield up on the Mesa and had come across the wagon train of the Confederate Texans. 
about 80 wagons, over 500 uh, horses and mules, and uh, they were looking down on them. And this was at uh, Apache uh, Creek. Uh, it was actually um, Canyon Cito, I think it was the name of where they had lined up all their all their uh, wagons, supply wagons. So Shivington went ahead and gathered them all in a, one big bonfire and burned them all up. They either killed or drove off over 500 mules and horses. And uh, this was toward the end of the main battle after the, the Confederates had basically moved the Union uh, troops off the field. Uh, Union, the, the Confederates, the rebels, the Texans were saying, We've won. This is a victory for us. And then word came back down to them that all their supply wagons, all their horses, all their mounts were gone. Both sides seemed to think they were victors. Uh, the Texans thought they were uh, victors. And the, uh, at, when the supply wagons were destroyed, the Confederate, or the uh, Union rather, knew that they were uh, victors. So uh, in actuality, there were similar losses on both sides. Uh, it was a, uh, a tactical victory for the Texans, but a strategic victory for the Union. With all the ammunition, supplies, rations gone, the Texans had no choice but to uh, re retreat, uh, to move south. They went back to, first they went to Sa uh, Santa Fe. Uh, Santa Fe. Um, and Albuquerque. There was a small 200 plus uh, soldiers in Albuquerque. Uh, the, most of the main force uh, went to Santa Fe. Uh, a lot of the residents sympathized, according to, the, to uh, A.B. Pedicolis' uh, journal. A lot of the uh, residents sympathized with the Texans, but many refused to take the con Confederate script for uh, payment. The uh, Canby, uh, being, uh, in, being uh, pretty smart, uh, decided that uh, he needed to get the rebels out of Santa Fe. Interestingly enough, his wife, Canby's wife, was in Santa Fe during the Texas occupation of the city. And Canby's wife nursed both sides, wounded from both sides, because there were a lot of wounded in the battle. And so uh, Canby's wife uh, helped nurse uh, all those uh, uh, from both sides. And it's mentioned in A.B. Pedicolis' uh, uh, journal and and he doesn't he does when he mentions he doesn't seem to think that it's a big deal he just well Camby's wife was there and she was ministering to both sides so uh, Union forces uh, decided to uh, they were coming down from you know well first of all Gloria had passed but they also were coming up from Fort Craig so uh, Canby uh, made kind of a faint attack to uh, Albuquerque, and he did this primarily to get the, uh, the uh, Texans out of Santa Fe, because there were only about 200 uh, uh, Texans in Albuquerque. And so as soon as the, uh, they started uh, artillery shelling Albuquerque, uh, you know, Sibley uh, basically sent a dispatch to uh, Santa Fe and said, get down here and reinforce me. And, uh, but the Union forces could have overpowered them very easily, but they didn't, because all they want to do is get them out of Santa Fe. And then as Union forces uh, started massing uh, east of Albuquerque, the uh, Sibley uh, Brigade, shore and rations, uh, shore and ammunition, they, had, they figured they probably had one day of ammunition left uh, for a one day battle. They had to move south. They had to uh, vacate uh, the, uh, the city of Albuquerque. And uh, in fact, they left eight uh, Confederate infect uh, I'm sorry, ineffective mountain howitzers, which they'd hauled all the way up from Texas. And uh, these are short-barreled kind of mountain howitzers. Uh, there's one right there. And uh, they decided, uh, rather than take those, because they didn't have the mules and horses to haul them, they buried them. And they buried them right there in the Albuquerque Plaza. Later on, uh, Colonel Teal, Major Teal, sorry, Major Teal, who was in charge of the artillery, went back some 20 odd years later and recovered those, uh, those uh, mountain howitzers. And this one is uh, in, the, uh, in a museum in Albuquerque to this day. So as they're uh, leaving Albuquerque, A.B. Pedicolis had a chance when he was in Albuquerque to do a few uh, uh, sketches. 
And if you notice, here, here's a, a church. Here's the, uh, here is the Albuquerque Plaza. Two points I want to show you. One, there's the mountain howitzers right there that they eventually buried right there in the plaza. And here, that's the Texas flag, not the stars and bars, which I find interesting. Uh, this area here was uh, as they started uh, um, vacating Albuquerque. And A.B. Petacolas talks about it in his journal. He says, uh, well, we're going to go across the river today, but I don't think it's going to really be one day. And he was right. It took several days to get all the troops across the river. If you look closely, you'll see this is A.B. Petacolas making the sketch. He did this in a lot of his sketches. He put himself in the, in the picture. And so uh, because, he was, because it took a couple days, he had time to, to do a sketch. So they, uh, in, their, in their travels back down the Rio Grande, they decided to avoid Fort Craig because it was still occupied. So they actually went around the west side of uh, Fort Craig. And they're, they're short of water. They're short of rations. They're uh, leaving Albuquerque. Sibley uh, gave one wagon to each company for belongings. All those were probably gone by the time they got about halfway down to, to Franklin. Um, a, um, a union officer, cavalry officer, retracing some of the, uh, the route that the Texans took around Fort Craig a few months later said that the whole route was uh, covered with gear that was shed by the uh, Confederates as they basically fled south. When they got to, uh, they were also short on water. And, and they had to split up the, uh, the army. They couldn't all travel to one water hole after another because it was, they'd overcome the water hole. So they actually split, uh, according to A.B. Pentecost, they split the, uh, the rebel forces so that they weren't all inundating one, you know, one water source at a time. And then they also took various different routes uh, to get back to Franklin. So once uh, they got back to Franklin, they spent about a month uh, recouping, resting, reading. A.B. Petticlose talks about he uh, was, did a lot of sketching. Uh, the, um, uh, this is a sketch that uh, A.B. Petticlose made of a uh, Texan soldier. A couple points. Um, he made a mention that the uh, soldier was carrying the rifle in the modern way, which is over the, slung over the shoulder, which I found interesting. Well, how else would you carry the rifle? You know, you just cross you know, across your back uh, or, you know, slung that way. But apparently it was, you know, he considered that the modern way of uh, carrying a rifle. Um, the, uh, you'll also notice he has a knife there and, uh, and he's uh, actually uniformed in some Union clothing uh, articles, uniform articles. Um, the following, oh, the other thing I wanted to point out was, so when Petacolas was in Santa Fe, he actually was able to go get some drawing paper and a, and a, and a portfolio so he could put stuff. So some of his drawings are on actually regular paper. But many of his drawings are part of the journal, as, as is this one as you can see the lines in the, uh, in the journal writing. So here's some of the uh, things that he did uh, while he was in uh, Franklin, Texas. Uh, this is actually looking what is now downtown El Paso across the river. Now there's the, the, the river is beyond there looking into Mexico. And there's old A.B. Petacolas uh, doing his sketching. So. This was a uh, hospital that uh, was in uh, Franklin. And uh, I found that uh, a couple of these were, you know, were really good. Like, you know, that one's you know, pretty good drawing. He had time to, to sit down and really do a nice drawing. This one in particular, I think, of the hospital is, uh, is very good. Uh, around uh, um, May, they, uh, excuse me, June, uh, July time frame, they vacated uh, Franklin and started heading back to San Antonio. A lot of his uh, volume one was destroyed in the wagon train. So 
Um, this was all in volume two, and so he recreated some of the drawings that he had, he had made on his way to Franklin. This was the um, stage station that uh, he sat down and did uh, in his journal. And this was a, a, a nice picture, and it's not in the journal. This is on a regular uh, piece of drawing paper of uh, Fort Davis. And you'll notice uh, some of the interesting facts. Uh, fort Davis, there's no palisade around it. It's a fort, but you know, usually when you think of a frontier force, you think of there's a palisade and all that stuff. But many of the forts in West Texas were just a series of, of buildings and uh, where, the, where the troops could, uh, could live. So this was uh, Fort Davis. And here's a, a real good drawing of the wagon train as they moved back to San Antonio. And uh, it, you know, very, I, I can't, you know, it's too bad it was no color because you can imagine what the uh, mountains uh, over here looked like with uh, uh, the color of uh, south, uh, southwest Texas. So after he returned to San Antonio, A.B. Petacolis uh, made a, a sketch of himself. Uh, a couple interesting uh, things on this sketch is that one, here's his overcoat, and that was uh, the overcoat that he was probably wearing when he was intercepted by that major thinking he was a Union, a union soldier. And the other uh, point was he never mentions the fact he had a pistol, but apparently he did. He had a, he had a pistol that he uh, carried with him. And, uh, but it's a pretty nice uh, little drawing of him. Remember I talked to you about the drawing of Victoria, Texas at the beginning of his, uh, of his time on the, in, those, in the Sibley Brigade to, to invade New Mexico. This is the same drawing five years later. When I say the same, it's a little bit different uh, view, but it's the same area. And you notice the provost guard of the Union Army has taken up occupation forces in Victoria, Texas. And that's, that was the point of his, of his uh, drawing here, I think, was the, the fact that uh, he, he, in fact, right after the Civil War ended, was considered a POW in Victoria. He had returned to Victoria, the provost guard there, and he was a prisoner of war in Victoria, I guess, under house arrest until they finally uh, pro, uh, let, let all the Confederate soldiers go. But, uh, so this was, a, this was the provost guard. So, what did, uh, what did he do after, he, after the Civil War? So during the Civil War, he was all four years, three and a half, four years, he was in the uh, Confederate Army. He also participated, there was a couple battles in Louisiana that he participated in. Um, he was actually uh, medicaled out, not out completely, but he uh, couldn't partake in field activities. Uh, he had a real dysentery very badly, so uh, they gave him a, a desk job toward the end of the war, but then he was in Victoria, Texas. So he returned to his uh, law practice when he got back to uh, Texas and after the war. Uh, he married, and then unfortunately his uh, new bride of two years and uh, a child uh, died of yellow fever, and he remarried, so he's widowed and remarried. Uh, he had three very successful sons. One was uh, Warren Petacolis, who was a lawyer and later became a federal judge in the El Paso area. His other two sons were uh, engineers, uh, very successful engineers. Uh, A.B. Uh, became a judge in, the, in Victoria. Uh, he wrote a law book uh, on Texas civil and criminal law, and that law book was used all the way up into the 20th century as a, uh, as a law book in, uh, in Texas. Uh, he also had hobbies. He became a skilled furniture maker. Uh, he played chess. He was, seemed to be very, he was very good at chess, apparently. And uh, he, was, he was in prominent uh, Victoria society. And there's a lot of the things that, uh, that he did in and around Victoria are now in museums, uh, including some of these sketches in uh, Victoria. He died in 1915, so he had a long life. 
and he was very proud of being a Texas soldier, as you can see. Confederate takes Army, May 27th, 1838 to 1915. Fourth Company Four, I'm sorry, Fourth Troop, what is it? Fourth, Fourth Texas, he was a sergeant, uh, Company Four, uh, Texas Cavalry. And actually, they were considered mounted infantry, I guess. So that's it. So I'd like to thank you for coming. I appreciate uh, uh, you all listening. And uh, that kind of concludes our, our presentation. So thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Q and A. Anybody have any questions? Obviously. Obviously, you have a question. Go ahead. You got it. You got it. Anybody else? Um, they left Texas. They left Victoria with about 2,500 troops. Actually, with San Antonio, with about 2,500. Okay. The he he his company. I don't know how many were in his company in Victoria, but he was uh, he became Company C or his unit became Company C out of San Antonio, part of the Brigley Sibley Brigade, which was about 2,500 men. Yeah. So after after the Battle of uh, Val Verde and then Glorieta Pass. Casualties, uh, desertions, yes. attrition. When they went back to Franklin, leaving gear behind, and right. farmed away, they'd lost all their horses and mules. Approximately, when they got back, do you have any idea? When they got back you know, I don't know exactly, but I'm, 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 I think I remember seeing some figures uh, that in my research, uh, 1,200 to 1,500, something like that. They had about 50 percent loss. Yeah, yeah. A lot of it was, you know, casualties. A lot of sickness on the trail. Right. Uh, a lot of sickness. Uh, there were some desertions also that he mentions in his journal, and uh, and of course those killed. Uh, and wounded, and I was surprised that, they, well, and I shouldn't have been, but uh, the number of wounded that, that died uh, in hospital after the, after the battle. There was about half the wounded died, so, uh, which is interesting. His uh, grade marker said sergeant. Yes, he was. But he was a company commander. No, no, he was not. He was, he was the, he had been voted. So in Victoria, and I, I should have uh, mentioned this, uh, when he uh, enlisted so in the, in the Volunteers of Victoria, under the Victoria Blues and Victoria Invincibles, the tradition was to elect your officers and your non-commissioned officers. He was elected what they called the fifth sergeant. I don't know exactly what the fifth sergeant is, but he was elected the fifth sergeant. And he was a sergeant then throughout the three and a half years, he was, uh, four years he was uh, in the Confederate Army, he was a sergeant. Yeah. So, on the map, sort of shows Petacolis's movement. Yeah. That was his unit. That was his unit. But he wasn't in command. No, no, unit. he was not in command. That was his unit, and he moved uh, south around uh, the the periphery of the battlefield. That was uh, his unit. That's where his unit was uh, operating, and uh, when he got intermingled with the Union troop, or with yeah, with the Union. Uh, Troops, which I you know, I thought that was pretty pretty cool, where he uh, he kind of very casually sauntered away. <laughs> but said he was going to go up there and take a shot at. Them. Well, yeah, because he he's talking to this this uh, major. He goes, oh yeah, I see those guys shoot me. Well, hell, let me go. I'll go take a shot at him. <laughs> and then he disappeared uh, around the bend, you know. So. And, and the, uh, the major was actually a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he's the only one that was on the field at that point uh, in, at that time. Gloria. Yeah, and a, a lieutenant colonel's uh, insignia and a, and a major insignia is very similar. So it's easy to make that mistake. Um, and uh, he was wearing this uh, great coat. So I was asking some of the reenactors out here about the great coat that uh, the Union uh, the, uh, that the Texans were wearing because they were Union greatcoats. And uh, he was telling me that, the, that he, Petacolis may have been wearing a frock coat that was an officer's coat. And if he was, that's why the Major, or Lieutenant Colonel Tapan was his name, T-A-P-P-O-N, that's why he thought he was a captain. He said, hey, Captain, you know, you may get shot here. Oh. Uh, I didn't realize there were two different coats, so he may have just 
on the battlefield earlier on picked up a, a Union coat that was an officer's coat. So Philippe. Felipe, yes. Left uh, Haiti. Yes. As a stowaway with his wife and kids. That's the family that they. I never found anything. You know exactly that that that's what happened in written history, but I have we have the family has an oral history that he actually stowed away on the uh, on an American ship. So out of the Haiti. record, you're a direct descendant of an illegal alien. It's an a <laughs> when, yes, that's that's true, that's true exactly. Now a lot of us are. Yeah. Into the border, buddy. Absolutely. I uh, also uh, wanted to mention that uh, I was very. Um, I'm not well adept at PowerPoint uh, presentations because I'm not that technical on on Microsoft. So you can fly an A6. that's true. I can fly an A6. So I'd like to thank my daughter, who's in the audience here back here. She helped me with the uh, PowerPoint presentation, and she she did some of the editing on on it. And uh, in fact, that's her job. She is a, a book editor. So. Um, I wanted to thank her. Also thank uh, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth uh, did all the photocopying for me. So I didn't want to interrupt you during your talk, but I was dying of curiosity to know on that one uh, Fetacola sketch, mm -hmm. uh, I believe of the Battle of Valverde. Yeah. There was an area on the left side that looked like a snake skin or something. And I was wondering, dying to know what you think that it, yeah, this portion over here. Oh, that's a rock. Actually, that's a mountain. And it's actually talked about uh, a little bit in, uh, uh, if you look some, do some research on the battle, they talk about this mountain on the left-hand side of the battle. Shaped yeah. the battle on that side. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and then the, his sketch actually was half of it's gone. So you, you missed out on some of that. It's so. a tremendous shame that when they destroyed the wagon train, they destroyed the volume one of his yeah. journal. And he was, fascinating. he was sick. And he talks about it in his journal. He said he, when he found out that the wagons were destroyed, he actually went back to see if he, he could recover anything. And he says it was all gone. And he, said it's, he says it's the worst thing that ever happened to him. Well, I wouldn't say the worst, but he was, he but was he very was upset. about it. Yes, yeah. yeah. So when. Uh, when they got to, uh, was it to Santa Fe or Albuquerque, where they turned in their animals? Yeah, it was just, to the Confederate government. Well, no, that was actually right after Valverde, because they didn't have enough animals to haul uh, wagons, artillery, and be mounted. So uh, what they did was they consolidated their animals that they did have. So they just kept the draft animals. Right, and the infantry. Five hundred of them. That right. Were loose. After the Battle of... Well, the 500, now that was a different part of the battle. That was after the Glorieta battle. So when they were yeah. killed and uh, the horses and mules were killed and, and let loose. Yeah. But after Valverde, they didn't have enough fodder for their animals. Exactly. That's why they turned them into the Confederate government. That's correct. And that's when he got 100 He got 110 script. For his horse. Yeah, yeah. And actually, it wasn't even script. It was just a, a promise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was just a promise. So, so that... You can look at that and say that was a major error to go on foot to Glorietta. Yeah, well, there was a, they had no choice. There was well, they had no choice. They had to either well, like I said, there were three options after after Battle of Valverde. You could either go, you know, retreat uh, to back to Franklin, set up a siege on Fort Craig, and and Sibley thought that Fort Craig was was too strong to take in, in a, a short siege. And then go on north to Santa Fe and hopefully capture more military supplies and, and rations in Albuquerque and uh, Santa Fe. So they, he elected to go Did north. Did they get some animals in Santa Fe? I'm sorry? Did they get some animals? Yeah, they picked up animals along the way, but, but not uh, significant. Uh, yeah, Lou, did you want me to? Yeah, I stand to the right. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Oh, hold on, I'm sorry. Lou? I was wondering if you could move forward to where you had that stage place that they went past. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. 
Oh, there it is. Okay. Stage so, station. Do you know where that was at? Well, it's uh, 12 miles from San Elizario on 9 June, and I'm not sure exactly where San, but I can go back to that map. I think it's on the... Um, that's all right. The reason I asked is when my wife and I went and toured that part of the country. Yeah. Then if you go east of El Paso and directly north of Big Bend National Park, there's an old stage station which has been converted into a quasi-hotel Oh, really? And I'm just curious whether this might have been it. his route, whether that was the one. Yeah, you know, I, and I don't know. But if we go back, so here's San Elizario right here. And he said it was 12 miles south, so it would have been in the Big Bend Park okay, there. So it was, yeah, that's not the same one then. Oh. Uh, that's too far west. Is it? Yeah. What's the fort that's in that area? Fort Bliss? No, no, no. Fort, it's, a, it's a national monument. Now. Fort Quitman? They have Fort Quitman, Fort Bliss, Fort Fillmore. Um, I think there were some other forts. It's been kind of restored. Fort Davis? Maybe Fort Davis. That's that right, right there. Yeah. You can go down to Fort Union also if you want to. Oh yeah. That yeah, I've I've been to Fort Union. It's a great uh, place to go. Now the way Fort Union exists right now, which is basically adobe that is melted into the surrounding countryside, except for the chimneys, if you've been there. Yeah. Uh, but that was not the uh, that was not the Fort Union. I mean, if, if the place is the same, but that wasn't built until the 1880s. Fort Union in the uh, uh, 1860s was basically uh, buildings and mounds of earth with artillery surrounding it. It was uh, not uh, a big, a big fort. So it's not what it is. Not what it what it appears to be today. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Where is Victoria? Where is Victoria? Well, when I was, uh, Victoria is in South Texas. Victoria is just north of, uh, it's, it's about 100 miles uh, southeast of San Antonio. It's about uh, 55 miles uh, east and north slightly of uh, Beeville, Texas. No, it's not, unfortunately. I, I should have. Yeah, I don't have. It's right, if you can, here's San Antonio. And so Beeville and uh, Victoria are, are right down here in the kind of the lower South Texas, we consider South here, Texas. Here's a chance to clear up a misconception a lot of people have when they hear Beeville, they think that's slang for Brownsville. Yeah. It's not. Oh, it's yeah. B E E. Correct. Ville. And it's the county seat of B County, and their motto is the um of the yeah, we were both in uh, flight and instructors there, travel. so yeah, different times. But, but you named the guys. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Marine and Navy. Oh, Marine and right. Navy, that's right. Oh, man, oh, man. That's right. Any other questions? John, back, yeah. in, back in his, uh, your, one of those portraits there, like his self portrait. Uh huh. To me, he looks a little bit like Vincent Van Gogh. <laughs> with, the, with the last one toward the end? Yeah. Like the self, like that. Yeah, with two ears. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He had long hair, though. <laughs> By today's standards, do you think that he could have been a professional photographer or a painter? Yeah, I think he probably could have been. His, you know, he came from a family of painters yeah. and, uh, and artists and musicians, I might add. There were a lot of, a lot of his... Uh, Father and his grandfather were also musicians. That's what they did when they came to the United States. Uh, his father, Felipe, when he came to the United States, he not only was an artist, but he also taught music. Oh. They came from? From, Fran from, well, from France to Haiti to the US. So Felipe Petacolis, Felipe Abraham Petacolis, um, was a, he was actually born in France. He uh, served in the, Bavari the King, B King of Bavarian Army for about eight years after he had gone to university, after he had studied uh, art. And then while he was, in the, while he was working as a, 
I don't know whether he was enlisted or was an officer or what, but he also studied art during the time he was in the military. And then, How did it happen that he ended up in the Bavarian army, a Frenchman? Well, because it's right next door. <laughs> I, basically, I, I think it was, and there was a lot of, uh, this was prior to, Nap just before Napoleon, so. Probably before the boundaries were quite different. Yeah, yeah. Now, the reason why he went to Haiti was interesting, too. So, um, he had, his, his, his father was named Nicholas Petacolis. Nicholas Petacolis was a major in the French army. And uh, Nicholas Petacolis had several sons. Uh, Felipe was one. And there was another one who had established a plantation in Haiti. And that son had uh, died and left his plantation to Felipe Petacolis. And that's why Felipe Petacolis left France to go to Haiti to uh, basically secure his uh, his uh, inheritance of a plantation. But when he got there, it was just at the start of the uh, slave rebellion of 1889, 1890, 1891. And, uh, they were, and if, if, if you look at some of the history of the slave rebellion, it was pretty uh, gruesome. There were a lot of massacres. And uh, he had a, a, young, a young wife and son. And uh, he was, uh, apparently, he was made a captain in the local volunteer group to, put, to help put down the slave rebellion. And, and there's stories uh, that I've read you know, online that say that he actually participated in a couple battles in Haiti on this. But his wife was not happy with that. And he, was not, he, he felt that there was a real danger there. So he wanted to put his wife and, and son uh, on a ship to the United States for safety. Well, the story goes, the family history, is that when he got on the ship, he, he went on the ship to basically see his wife and child off. And his wife had convinced the American sailors to stow him away and hide him. So when they came looking for him, this is, the, this is all oral history. When they came looking for him, they couldn't find him. He stowed away, and the ship sailed, and he was out of there. Whether he wanted to be or not. Yep. One thing I was curious about was where Amherst Virginia is, so I looked it up while you were speaking. Yeah. And it's right in the center of the, of the state. Yeah. Uh, near Lynchburg. Right, Lynchburg. And he talks about that a little bit in, in, uh, in his book, in the journal. Uh, he was uh, raised in uh, Petersburg, Richmond uh, area. Uh, his father was uh, from Richmond. And, and if, you look at, if you go back to the Felipe, when he, when he, he went to Philadelphia, and so he had four sons. And those four sons uh, were born in the mid-70s, uh, excuse me, mid-90s through uh, 1804. In 1804, according to the census, he, and according to some advertisements, because he advertises for his painting, in, he started advertising for his miniature. miniature painting portraiture in Richmond in 1804. And he showed up in the census in 1810. Right. So, well, this was, now that's Felipe. So then uh, Amherst, uh, Lynchburg, was apparently where I think Robert Brown was practicing the law. Yeah, family. yeah. And he went there to study law. To study law. And that's how he got to Lynchburg, yeah. Robert Brown. Even though he was raised really in Richmond, Petersburg area. Okay, good. Well, yeah. thank you, John. Sure. That was great. <laughs> great. Sure, thank you. I knew it would be. Oh, good. Uh. Here's the uh, clicker. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good, oh, here good work. Oh, yeah. no. Why okay. didn't you tell everybody you just made all the stuff up? I did. I made it all up. <laughs> Kim, I, I would never have been able to do the PowerPoint. She, she adjusted all the pictures, so sort of thing. But if it had been for you, she wouldn't have been here to help. Well, that's true. So there you go. It's kind of an even yeah. exchange kind of thing. Yeah. I do it all the time, so it's easy for me. So. If you, uh, by the way, if you want to write a book, I know you. 
he would edit some books up there, but that's that's Kim's job. She, she has her own business uh, in, in publishing, self-published books and such. Are you involved with the Colorado? Uh, oh, Colorado okay. Independent.